Hi, welcome back to Storytime for Grown-Ups. Today we'll be continuing with Bram Stoker's Dracula. Thus far in our story, Jonathan Harker, having arrived in Transylvania, made a very interesting journey up to Castle Dracula, where he was greeted by his host, the Count Dracula. Um, after a couple of mostly normal days, a few odd and troubling occurrences happened. Um, Jonathan was very off-put by his new nighttime existence, as he stayed up very, very late speaking with the Count, and his schedule got all discombobulated. He was a bit put off as well by the Count and some of his odd habits and mannerisms. Uh, after kind of poo-pooing one of the Count's admonitions, which was for Jonathan to remain in his room when he slept, uh, Jonathan went to a different part of the castle, went to sleep, and had a very odd experience where he saw three beautiful women who almost hypnotized him and terrified him. He woke up the next morning um, aware that he had been made a prisoner in the Count's castle. The Count maintained a veneer of civility, but was altogether terrifying. Uh, Jonathan began kind of a countdown for his last days, as the Count had had him write several post-dated letters, presumably because the post was not entirely to be relied upon, and he didn't want the letters to go unsent, um, and for Jonathan's loved ones to worry. So Jonathan knew that this last letter, saying that he had left Bistritz, which is the town by Castle Dracula, was to be posted on the 29th of June, and also knew that that was probably the last day of his life. So coming to the 29th of June, after having attempted to get the key to escape from the castle, and in doing so found that the Count was asleep in a tomb, in a churchyard graveyard, buried in dirt, uh, and gorged with blood. Jonathan tried to escape, and the last that we heard was his last writings before his final attempt to escape, uh, calling a goodbye to Mina and worrying about both his potential for living and the state of his eternal soul, should he not escape this dread place. So now let us go to chapter five. Letter from Miss Mina Murray to Miss Lucy Westenra. 9th May. My dearest Lucy, forgive my long delay in writing, but I have been simply overwhelmed with work. The life of an assistant schoolmistress is sometimes trying. I am longing to be with you and by the sea where we can talk together freely and build our castles in the air. I have been working very hard lately because I want to keep up with Jonathan's studies, and I have been practicing shorthand very assiduously. When we are married, I shall be able to be useful to Jonathan, and if I can stenograph well enough, I can take down what he wants to say in this way, and write it out for him on the typewriter, at which also I am practicing very hard. He and I sometimes write letters in shorthand, and he is keeping a stenographic journal of his travels abroad. When I am with you, I shall keep a diary in the same way. I don't mean one of those two pages to the week with Sunday squeezed in a corner diaries, but a sort of journal which I can write in whenever I feel inclined. I do not suppose there will be much of interest to other people, but it is not intended for them. I may show it to Jonathan some day, if there is anything in it worth sharing, but it is really an exercise book. I shall try to do what I see lady journalists do, interviewing and writing descriptions and trying to remember conversations. I am told that, with a little practice, one can remember all that goes on or that one hears said during a day. However, we shall see. I will tell you of my little plans when we meet. I have just had a few hurried lines from Jonathan from Transylvania. He is well and will be returning in about a week. I am longing to hear all his news. It must be so nice to see strange countries. I wonder if we, I mean Jonathan and I, shall ever see them together. There is the ten o'clock bell ringing. Goodbye, your loving Nina. Tell me all the news when you write. You have not told me anything for a long time. I hear rumors, and especially of a tall, handsome, curly-haired man. Letter. Lucy Westerner to Mina Murray. 
17 Catham Street, Wednesday. My dearest Mina, I must say you tax me very unfairly with being a bad correspondent. I wrote to you twice since we parted, and your last letter was only your second. Besides, I have nothing to tell you. There is really nothing to interest you. Town is very pleasant just now, and we go a good deal to picture galleries and for walks and rides in the park. As to the tall, curly-haired man, I suppose it was the one who was with me at the last pop. Someone has evidently been telling tales. That was Mr. Holmwood. He often comes to see us, and he and Mama get on very well together. They have so many things to talk about in common. We met some time ago a man that would just do for you, if you were not already engaged to Jonathan. He is an excellent parti, being handsome, well-off, and of good birth. He is a doctor and really clever, just fancy. He is only nine and twenty, and he has an immense lunatic asylum all under his own care. Mr. Holmwood introduced him to me, and he called here to see us, and often comes now. I think he is one of the most resolute men I ever saw, and yet the most calm. He seems absolutely imperturbable. I can fancy what a wonderful power he must have over his patients. He has a curious habit of looking one straight in the face, as if trying to read one's thoughts. He tries this very much with me, but I flatter myself he has got a tough nut to crack. I know that from my glass. Do you ever try to read your own face? I do, and I can tell you it is not a bad study and gives you more trouble than you can well fancy if you have never tried it. He says that I afford him a curious psychological study, and I humbly think I do. I do not, as you know, take sufficient interest in dress to be able to describe the new fashions. Dress is a bore. That is slang again, but never mind. Arthur says that every day. There, it is all out. Nina, we have told all our secrets to each other since we were children. We have slept together and eaten together and laughed and cried together, and now, though I have spoken, I would like to speak more. Oh, Nina, couldn't you guess? I love him. I am blushing as I write, for although he, I think he loves me, he has not told me so in words, but, oh, Mina, I love him. I love him. I love him. There. That does me good. I wish I were with you, dear, sitting by the fire and dressing, as we used to sit, and I would try to tell you what I feel. I do not know how I am writing this even to you. I am afraid to stop, or I should tear up the letter, and I don't want to stop, for I do so want to tell you all. Let me hear from you at once, and tell me all that you think about it. Mina, I must stop. Good night. Bless me in your prayers, and, Mina, pray for my happiness. Lucy. P.S. I need not tell you this is a secret. Good night again. Oh. Letter from Lucy Westerner to Mina Murray. 24th May. My dearest Mina, thanks and thanks and thanks again for your sweet letter. It was so nice to be able to tell you and to have your sympathy. My dear, it never rains but it pours, how true the old proverbs are. Here am I, who shall be twenty in September, and yet I never had a proposal till today. Not a real proposal, and today I have had three. Just fancy, three proposals in one day. Isn't it awful? I feel sorry, really and truly sorry, for two of the poor fellows. Oh, Mina, I am so happy that I don't know what to do with myself, and three proposals. But for goodness sake, don't tell any of the girls, or they would be getting all sorts of extravagant ideas, and imagining themselves injured and slighted if in their very first day at home they did not get six at least. Some girls are so vain. You and I, Mina, dear, who are engaged and are going to settle down soon, soberly into old married woman, can despise vanity. Well, I must tell you about the three, but you must keep it a secret, dear, from everyone. Except, of course, Jonathan. You will tell him, because I would, if I were in your place, certainly tell Arthur. A woman ought to tell her husband everything. Don't you think so, dear? And I must be fair. Men like women, certainly their wives, to be quite as fair as they are, and women, I'm afraid, are not always quite as fair as they should be. Well, my dear, number one came just before lunch. I told you of him, Dr. John Seward, the lunatic asylum man with the strong jaw and the good forehead. He was very cool outwardly, but was nervous all the same. 
He had evidently been schooling himself as to all sorts of little things and remembered them, but he almost managed to sit down on his silk hat, which men don't generally do when they are cool. And then when he wanted to appear at ease, he kept playing with a lancet in a way that made me nearly scream. He spoke to me, Nina, very straightforwardly. He told me how dear I was to him, though he had known me so little, and what his life would be with me to help and cheer him. He was going to tell me how unhappy he would be if I did not care for him, but when he saw me cry, he said that he was a brute and would not add to my present trouble. Then he broke off and asked if I could love him in time, and when I shook my head, his hands trembled, and then, with some hesitation, he asked me if I cared already for anyone else. He put it very nicely, saying that he did not want to wring my confidence from me, but only to know, because if a woman's heart was free, a man might have hope. And then, Mita, I felt a sort of duty to tell him that there was someone. I only told him that much, and then he stood up, and he looked very strong and very grave, and he took both my hands in his, and said he hoped I would be happy, and that if I ever wanted a friend, I must count him one of my best. Oh, Mina, dear, I can't help crying, and you must excuse this letter being all blotted. Being proposed to is all very nice and that sort of thing, but it isn't at all a happy thing when you have to see a poor fellow whom you know loves you honestly, going away and looking all broken-hearted, and to know that, no matter what he may say at the moment, you are passing quite out of his life. My dear, I must stop here at present. I feel so miserable, though I am so happy. Evening. Arthur has just gone, and I feel in better spirits than when I left off, so I can go on telling you about the day. Well, my dear. Number two came after lunch. He is such a nice fellow an American from Texas, and he looks so young and so fresh that it seems almost impossible that he has been to so many places and had such adventures. I sympathize with poor Desdemona when she had such a dangerous strain poured in her ear, even by a black man. I suppose that we women are such cowards that we think a man will save us from fears and we marry him. I know now what I would do if I were a man and wanted to make a girl love me. I know I don't. For there was Mr. Morris telling us his stories, and Arthur never told any, and yet... My dear, I am somewhat previous. Mr. Quincy P. Morris found me alone. It seems that a man always does find a girl alone. No, he doesn't, for Arthur tried twice to make a chance, and I helping him all I could. I am not ashamed to say it now. I must tell you beforehand that Mr. Morris doesn't always speak slang. That is to say, he never does so to strangers or before them, for he really is well-educated and has exquisite manners. But he found out that it amused me to hear him talk American slang, and whenever I was present and there was no one to be shocked, he said such funny things. I am afraid, my dear, he has to invent it all, for it fits exactly into whatever else he has to say. But this is a way slang has. I do not know myself if I shall ever speak slang. I do not know if Arthur likes it, as I have never heard him use any as yet. Well, Mr. Morris sat down beside me and looked as happy and jolly as he could, but I could see all the same that he was very nervous. He took my hand in his and said, ever so sweetly, Miss Lucy, I know I ain't good enough to regulate the fixins of your little shoes, but I guess if you wait till you find a man that is, you, you'll go join them seven young women with the lamps when you quit. Won't you just hitch up alongside of me and let us go down the road together, driving in double harness? Well, he did look so good-humored and so jolly that it didn't seem half so hard to refuse him as it did poor Dr. Seward. So I said, as lightly as I could, that I did not know anything of hitching, and that I wasn't broken to harness at all yet. Then he said that he'd spoken in a light manner, and he hoped that if he had made a mistake in doing so on so grave, so momentous an occasion for him, I would forgive him. He really did look serious when he was saying it, and I couldn't help feeling a bit serious, too. I know, Mina, you will think me a horrid flirt, though I couldn't help feeling a sort of exultation that he was number two in one day. And then, my dear, before I could say a word, he began pouring out a perfect torrent of love-making, laying his very heart and soul at my feet, he looked so earnest over it that I shall never say again, think that a man must be playful always and never earnest because he is merry at times. 
I suppose he saw something in my face which checked him, for he suddenly stopped, and said with a sort of manly fervor that I could have loved him, for if I had been free. Lucy, you're an honest-hearted girl, I know. I should not be here speaking to you, as I am now, if I did not believe your clean grit right through to the very depths of your soul. Tell me, like one good fellow to another, is there anyone else that you care for? And if there is, I'll never trouble you a hair's breadth again, but will be, if you will let me, a very faithful friend. My dear Mina, why are men so noble when we women are so little worthy of them? Here was I almost making fun of this great-hearted true gentleman. I burst into tears. I am afraid, my dear, you will think this a very sloppy letter in more ways than one, and I really felt very badly. Why can't they let a girl marry three men? or as many as want her, and save all this trouble. But this is heresy. I must not say it. I am glad to say that, though I was crying, I was able to look into Mr. Morris's eyes and told him out straight. Yes, there is someone I love, though he has not told me yet that he even loves me. I was right to speak to him so frankly, for quite a light came into his face, and he put out both his hands and took mine. I think I put them into his and said in a hearty way, That's my brave girl. It's better worth being late for a chance of winning than being in time for another girl in the world. Don't cry, my dear. If it's for me, I'm a hard nut to crack, and I take it standing up. If that other fellow doesn't know his happiness, well, he better look for it soon, or he'll have to deal with me. Little girl, your honesty and pluck have made me a friend, and that's rarer than a lover. It's more unselfish, anyhow, my dear. I'm going to have a pretty lonely walk between this and kingdom come. Won't you give me one kiss? It'll be something to keep off the darkness now and then. You can, you know, if you like, for that other good fellow. He must be a good fellow, my dear, and a fine fellow, or you could not love him. Hasn't spoken yet. That quite won me, Nina, for it was brave and sweet of him, and noble, too, to a rival, wasn't it? And he's so sad, so... I leant over and kissed him. He stood up with my two hands in his, and as he looked down into my face, I'm afraid I was blushing very much, he said, Little girl, I hold your hand and you've kissed me, and if these things don't make us friends, nothing ever will. Thank you for your sweet honesty to me, and goodbye. He wrung my hand and, taking up his hat, went straight out of the room without looking back without a tear or a quiver or a pause, and I am crying like a baby. Oh, why must a man like that be made unhappy when there are lots of girls about who would worship the very ground he trod on? I know I would if I were free, only I don't want to be free. My dear, this quite upset me, and I feel I cannot write of happiness just at once after telling you of it, and I don't wish to tell of the number three until it can be all happy. Ever your loving Lucy. P.S. Oh, about number three. I didn't tell you of number three, need I? Besides, it's also confused. It seemed only a moment from his coming into the room till both his arms were round me and he was kissing me. I am very, very happy, and I don't know what I have done to deserve it. I must only try in the future to show that I am not ungrateful to God for all his goodness to me in sending to me such a lover, such a husband, and such a friend. Goodbye. Dr. Seward's Diary. Captain Phonograph. 25th May. Ebb tide and appetite today. Cannot eat, cannot rest, so diary instead. Since my rebuff of yesterday, I have a sort of empty feeling. Nothing in the world seems of sufficient importance to be worth the doing. As I knew that the only cure for this sort of thing was work, I went down amongst the patients. I picked out one who has afforded me a study of much interest. He is so quaint that I am determined to understand him as well as I can. Today I seem to get nearer than ever before to the heart of his mystery. I questioned him more fully than I had ever done, with a view to making myself master of the facts of his hallucinations. In my manner of doing it there was, I now see, something of cruelty. I seemed to wish to keep him to the point of his madness, a thing which I avoid with the patients, as I would the mouth of hell. Memo.
Under what circumstances would I not avoid the pit of hell? Omnia Rome venalia sunt. Hell has its price. Verb. Sap. If there be anything beyond this instinct, it will be valuable to trace it afterwards accurately, so I had better commence to do so. Therefore, R. M. Renfield, Etat 59, Sanguine temperament, great physical strength, morbidly excitable, periods of gloom, ending in some fixed idea which I cannot make out. I presume that the sanguine temperament itself and the disturbing influences end in a mentally accomplished finish. A possibly dangerous man, probably dangerous if unselfish. In selfish men, caution is so secure an armor for their foes as for themselves. What I think of on this point is, when self is the fixed point, the centripetal force is balanced with the centrifugal. When duty, a cause, etc., is the fixed point, the latter force is paramount, and only accident or a series of accidents can balance it. Letter from Quincy P. Morris to the Honorable Arthur Holmwood, 25th May. My dear Art, we've told yarns by the campfire in the prairies and dressed one another's wounds after trying a landing at the Marquesas and drunk healths on the shores of Titicaca. There are more yarns to be told and other wounds to be healed and another health to be drunk. Won't you let this be at my campfire tomorrow night? I have no hesitation in asking you, as I know a certain lady is engaged to a certain dinner party and that you are free. There will only be one other, our old pal at the Korea, Jack Seward. He's coming too, and we both want to mingle our weeps over the wine cup and to drink a health with all our hearts to the happiest man in all the wide world, who has won the noblest heart that God has made and the best worth winning. We promise you a hearty welcome and a loving greeting and a health as true as your own right hand. We shall both swear to leave you at home if you drink too deep to a certain pair of eyes. Come. Yours as ever and always, Quincy P. Morris. Telegram from Arthur Holmwood to Quincy P. Morris. 26 May. Count me in every time. I bear messages which will make both your ears tingle. 